You're listening to Breakpoint This Week, where we're talking about the top stories of the week from a Christian worldview. Today, we're going to talk about the results of the election. What does this say about us, and what does it say about the future of the country? We have a lot to get to today. We're so glad you're with us. Stick around. Welcome to Breakpoint This Week. From the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, I'm Maria Baer, alongside John Stone Street, president of the Colson Center. John, wow, it's been a really big week. I have to say, I didn't realize how anxious I was about the probability that we would sit down to record the podcast on Friday morning and still not know the winner of the election this past Tuesday. And I'm I'm serious. Like I, I had sort of just resigned myself to thinking we're going to have to wait. And it it might, you know, my my husband boarded up his office downtown in a city we live in, just because the past several years have just been strange with regards to this stuff. So I got to say, my first reaction today is I'm so glad that we know the winner, that it's pretty decisive. And, um, you know, I'll just say for me personally, I'm glad for the way that the election turned out. But there's there was a ton that happened this week, not just, you know, a president being elected, but a lot of but, um, what you're saying is not a small thing. I'm going to jump in because I was. Yeah, at, please. I was, uh, you know, speaking at uh, Liberty University this week uh, at what's called Convo, which is their big kind of chapel service and was asked uh, by the president, one of the America's great leaders, uh, Don DeCostin, a Colson fellow, I must say, um, to come and talk about the election. And I said, Dondi, we're not going to know. And right. it became clear around 1230, we probably are going to know. And then, you know, early the next morning, of course, I had a two hour time shift, which all these East Coast speaking invites. I need to be invited to speak in Hawaii where I get eight hours more sleep, not two hours less. But um, that first world problems. Anyway, my point is, um, yeah, and we knew a lot and not just about what is at the top of the ticket, uh, although, you know, that race certainly um uh, was surprising that we had the results so quickly. Um, But it was all, and it was so decisive. Um, A friend and I were texting, he called it a landslide. I said, I'm not ready to call it that. Then the next morning, you know, it's not just the electoral college, it's the uh, popular vote. It's also the, uh, you know, holding the Senate and holding the House, which we didn't know at that time, but it's becoming pretty right. obvious. It was pr- pretty clear. And at that point, you're, you, you start talking about a decisiveness, um, that is, um, uh, you know, bigger than anything we, we, we would expect, especially given how close things are over the last, you know, several elections. I cer- certainly know Reagan in his second term, you know, which was what 49 states or 48 states, uh, can't, whichever one that was, but it was, it was decisive. That's the right word, um, in landslide territory, certainly. But we also knew a lot about a lot of other things. And, um, there, there, there is a ton to talk about and it's tempting to kind of get into the political fray on this, but, um, it was unexpected and it adds to the unexpected. How many unexpected things happened during this cycle? Right. I know. Such a strange. I, I still can't believe how l- relatively little we talk about the assassination attempts, even even in the conversations we have about, you know, the end of democracy. What does this mean for democracy in our political system? The fact that not not even just once, but twice that a, a candidate for U.S. president, there was an attempt made on his life is a big deal. And it's a bit. Listen, it's also a big deal. You're right. We don't talk enough about that. It's a it's it's a big deal how the 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 ticket came about. Um, you know, these were kind of unprecedented things. Thank God, you know, your husband's efforts to uh, board up his office were unnecessary. I know. And yeah. really across America. I, I listen, people expected that violence either way that it went and had good reason to expect that. And praise God it didn't happen. So that was unexpected. And yet, you, you know, when, when you kind of get to the heart of it, at least at the presidential level, and, and, and we have said from the very beginning, and I'm still convinced that the most important race was not at the top of the ticket. State level elections are becoming more important than ever before. And so we, we need to talk about some of those things too. But one could still look and say as many innovative and new things, unexpected things happen in this cycle. The results are actually in line. Bad economy, vice presidential candidate tied to the previous administration, 
just doesn't win, right? It just doesn't win. When you have those two things in place, it just doesn't happen. And, um, you know, the last time you can look back and say that a vice presidential candidate won was George H.W. Bush, but you're talking about a very strong economy and kind of riding off of the defeat of this Soviet Union, right? I mean, in other words, this was set at a high time, but when was the last time you're looking and saying, oh, it, you know, an incumbent vice president won when you're talking about economic uh, weakness. It just doesn't happen. So it, one of the great things, and there's so so much analysis on a political and cultural level to be done, the simplest explanation might be the best one, which is it's the economy, stupid. I don't think that's it. I think there are other things, mainly because I don't have a job if I don't think that there are other things. And so I'm going to, you know, <laughs> offer some other things. Um, but that, that as many weird and strange and crazy developments happen like one after another after another we still got that and um but that itself points to something else but uh but but that's what we got we 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 got the, the same rule of thumb which is it's the economy stupid i don't i know from my personal experience that was not as big of an influence as it seems like it would be only because i'm and this is my fault um, this does not mean it's not true, but I'm still a little bit unclear on exactly how who the president is directly influences, you know, like the cost of eggs. I, I get that it does. And I can understand I can conceptualize that, you know, like the way we trade with other nations and the subsidies we give to farmers and all these all these things are certainly connected um, and including like the ballooning national debt and, what you know, the social programs we decide to spend our money on. All of that stuff. I, I see how it's connected, but I didn't so much feel like, you know, I didn't even know what the left's, what Kamala Harris's policies about the economy were. I don't know that she ever explicitly stated them. So I could see that being a a big um, driver of this. But I agree with you. I think it was about more than just the economy. So why don't you, can you tell us, you know, if you want to just hit a few of the highlights, what are some sure. of the other major things you think influenced this? Well, let me hit the economy just, just, just quickly. I mean, yeah. I think the answer was if you want to know kind of what the argument is, you go back to the vice presidential debate, which was the only rational one we had, and listen to J.D. Vance's explanation of how um, it really goes back to oil and gas prices. And I think there's a lot of credence on that because there are some uh, inflationary measures that change everything else. Second, I don't know that it has to be thought out. In fact, I think it's just – you go and buy eggs and you're like, you got to be kidding me, right? And throughout most of this term, you know, going and buy gas and you're like, how many cars am I filling up here? You know, just <laughs> one. Like what? So it's, 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 it's the exit. And, and who do you blame, right? I mean, you're not going to blame the 7 Eleven clerk. Who are you going to blame? You you know, that, that's all kind of natural. So I'm, I'm not sure it's always well thought out. And I will also say too that the best kind of economic policy we did get from uh, Kamala Harris was giving away a lot of money. And even though people want freebies, there is, I think, at least some level across the board where there was still this, I don't trust that because no one trusts a free lunch, right? And, and of course, you, you can do the math pretty quickly and say, look, if you're going to do this plus this plus this and just give out a lot of money, the government doesn't have money. We have money that we give to the government in taxes. Right. And so there's only one way that math problem works. Now, that, that that's what I think is probably the extent of most economic analysis. But I, I think it's much more gut. And that brings up one of the big things, which is I heard this last night as I was flying another kind of news story and, and heard this, saw, saw this as a headline on articles all the way up to Election Day, on Election Day and since Election Day which is the economy's great. The economy's great. The economy's great. The economy's great. So this was a pretty constant refrain from media outlets. The economy's great. The economy's great. Why do people, and it was, it, it was those kind of headlines. The economy's great. Why do people think it's not, you know? How, and, and the reason people think it's not is we don't believe the headlines. And this goes to the trust issue that we have talked about so many times. And I think it came to a head. I think that's one of the factors. Now, the economy is just one example of it. There's more. The economic refrain that everything was great, everything was great, it's strong, it's strong, it's strong. And, 
you know, Harris was in a really tough spot, sure. right? Trying to say that it was great and also trying to say it was a new day, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, how do you hold those two? I mean, th- that tension is palpable for a vice president. And that's one of the reasons they don't get elected in a time when people sense something's wrong. But look, it's not just people sense something's wrong. We, we know what the prices are, right? We know um, that wages haven't kept up with that. We're feeling the inflation. We know what the interest rates, you know, just kind of the cost of everyday things has hit a level. Look, you go through the drive through at McDonald's, right? And you're like, a value meal is 11 bucks? Like, wh- what is happening, you know? This is things that I think exaggerated the divide between what we were, we were hearing and what we see. And by we now, I am talking about, by and large, America. The trust issue was big. And there was these notable things where the players started to, th- these notable events where the players started to see this. Bezos not endorsing, not allowing the paper to endorse a candidate. I watch CNN. I think CNN has great maps. <laughs> their maps are fantastic. I love their maps, right? I think the guy who runs the maps, I don't even know his name, but the guy is like a beautiful mind. He's just like, tink, 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 tink. <laughs> and it, you know, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, you can go down that rabbit hole, right? Uh, with him. So I'm going to put him on my, I'm making a list of winners and losers of the week. And I'm going to put CNN map guy is on the CNN winners. map guy is a winner. And I should know okay. his name, but I don't forgive me. But <laughs> the, um, CNN was so slow to call anything. I think it was three in the morning. Someone told me before, and I don't know if bed by then when they called New Jersey for Kamala Harris. I called New Jersey for <laughs> Kamala Harris three weeks ago. I mean, you know, it's not like that one's up in the air, right? Yeah, yeah, everyone knows. And then they were late to call the presidency, but there is a, but, but remember 16, they backpedaled. They called it quick and they backpedaled and they've been slow since. They had a very conservative comp political on, on a political level commentator. Uh, Scott Jennings, and they let him go. And to the extent that, and by they, I mean the host, but Van Jones and some of the other ones let him go. And when they have other left-leaning guests on there, they get really frustrated with him. There's this clip from just yesterday about this. But my point is, is that they tried to do things different. So I think th- this trust factor, particularly with those who supply us with information, you know, do we have it's the economy, stupid. But do we have the results that we had if Elon Musk doesn't buy Twitter four years ago and 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 provide this kind of massive counter at, at a degree that the potential of, of social media to be a counter to the to, to, to mainstream outlets? These are all fascinating cultural developments. Now, the worldview implications, I think, come back to trust. People need sources to trust. We don't trust. Maybe what ex- exaggerated these results the way that they were, yeah, you know, we were, we were being told again all day, this is the closest race we'll ever see. We're not going to know. We're not going to know. We're not going to know. There were a handful of voices going, yeah, we will. And it'll be like this. These were, none of them were the voices yeah. on, on the outlet. Some of them were politico. Some of them got lucky. Right. But again, like at a 16, 2016 level, everybody got this run wrong. And I put everybody in quotes here, but everybody got it wrong. The trust thing will continue to emerge. Even the leaders we elect, we're not sure we trust, right? We're kind of bouncing. And I th- I think it's going to be really important right now in terms of the Christian witness that, you know, who, who was it that said in a time of deception, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. The Sultanitsyn live not by lies. The, the power of truth tellers right now. First of all, you'll take a lot of shots. You'll get accused of all kinds of things. But the, the the untethering from truth, which, of course, we've been talking about for decades. Schaefer was talking about it before him. Other people were talking about it. But you have these kind of cultural moments. I've said, I said, I told the Liberty students, look, um, uh, and I said this in the world piece that I did. Mirrors reflect yourself. Elections are more mirrors than determiners. They, 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 they tell you where you're at. And this one was like a big yellow you are here arrow. And we look at the kind of the loss of trust and the significance of truth telling. This is one of those. I think that's probably the the headline of this. At least for me, it's the headline of the election. Yeah. There are other things too. I want to talk about the trans issue, but but go ahead. Yeah, and some of the state the state initiatives as well. Huge um, yeah. about a lot of a lot of worldview issues as well. So I'm just thinking while you're talking about a scene from Thirty Rock where Alec Baldwin walks into he gets a job at the Pentagon and he walks in. 
um, and the roof is leaking. And he goes, oh, you guys got a roof leak. And Matthew Broderick, who's the sort of bureaucrat in charge, goes, no, it's not. And Alec Baldwin goes, yeah, I'm getting wet. And Matthew Broderick goes, no, we formed a committee and we looked into it. It's not leaking. And it's like that that's the sense you get with a lot of these uh, political prognosticators. I have heard some. Um, like you said, some on CNN and some other places, like actually asking, how, how did we get this wrong? But one of the things I, I have been struck by is that, so I think it was 80, 81% of, um, you know, self-identified white evangelicals voted for Trump in 2016 or 2020. And it was 83% or something this time around. And since 2015, John, we've been told by, Many different, like a diverse array of writers and thinkers and pastors that supporting Donald Trump as a person and a candidate is going to harm the church's witness, that other people from outside of our evangelical community, who maybe are the people in our mission field, they will see our support for this person and they it will turn them off from Christianity. They won't come to church anymore. They won't. They'll think we're hypocrites and that kind of thing. That's been challenging to hear over and over again for all of these years. I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way where I never felt personally like I was giving assent or affirmation to, to certain things that Trump has either said or done. Um, by voting for him. And, and we've like, people have gone back and forth on this forever. I don't want to beat a dead horse. But what this brought home to me, especially looking at communities like people in lower economic class and also his, the Hispanic vote, which dramatically went towards Trump this time, uh, the vote of young men, the vote of women, like so many demographic points that we've been told for such a long time that he's going to chase them away and that they won't trust Christians anymore, in particular, who vote for him, swung towards him. And what this um, sort of gives me a feel, a sense of relief about is that to say that before, that people will see our vote or support or whatever, and they will be turned off, is to suggest that people, for some reason, people in communities outside of our own are not capable of looking at our vote as like a nuanced calculation. And the only possibility they will see for you having voted for Trump is that you are either racist or sexist or xenophobic or you're pro-fascism or something. And, and I think this ties into what the media got so wrong because so many people in high um, spheres of influence within the national media sent that message and are still sending it now. Like, well, I guess the country is full of, you know, people who have are, are racist or whatever. And I'm just relieved to see that my suspicions are correct, that people are smarter than that. And that people don't need to look at, you know, the church's support or or not support for any one political candidate as the beginning and end of the conversation. And I hope that this puts to rest this accusation. I don't think that it will, unfortunately, um, but I am relieved. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there to, to, to comment on. And I think that there is a, uh, a there, there, there's a lot. Number one is, is that number will be, you know, trumping it around, um, as, as proof that, you know, that evangelicals, despite Donald Trump's obvious and clear moral failings, compromised in order to, to, to do this. And some have, some have overlooked, some have justified things that are unjustifiable. Some are unwilling, uh, to call a spade a spade. Um, I, I don't think though that that's really explains the vast majority of that 83 percent um there listen you have to remember uh where the democratic party has gone when it comes to certain issues the democratic party issued rules and regulations that foster care parents who did not willingly go along with transing their foster children children known to have all kinds of mental comorbidities and things like that, of struggles, that they could no longer be foster parents, even if they had already proven themselves great foster parents. We got a rule, you know, on Title IX that still has to be mm -hmm. adju adjudicated. We had Kamala Harris begin her campaign at RuPaul's Drag Race. We had very clear clips of her saying that taxpayer dollars needed to go to, to allow help prisoners go through uh, medical transitioning. Uh, quote unquote. We had uh, very clear statements from this Department of Education 
and other ways in which the state was inserting itself between children and, and their parents. We had the progressive wing of the Democratic Party uh, hijack the rest of the Democratic Party on the issue of abortion to an extreme position that moved dramatically further to the left on that issue than any Republicans have moved to the right on that issue. A, a large number of that 83 percent were not really voting for Trump. They were voting against what was happening. The character things that are often pointed to are accurate about uh, President Trump. Uh, we were very clear and explicit here about the abandonment of um, the pro-life platform uh, in the, the RNC and, and what that means. And yet the problem is, is it's still, but by comparison, far more humane and respectful of life than the, uh, the DNC, which basically uh, weaponizes women's autonomy and calls it health care against the, against the pre-born. This is the thing is, is elections are never just votes for people. They're also votes against things. When, when we hear the prognostication on this, that's the position that a lot of us felt, you know, we, we were in. I don't think that this kind of damage to testimony, damage to witness can be the primary concern because that's a math game you can't, you can't keep when? up with. No, 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 you can't. It, it, it's, it's basically giving, uh, someone without a Christian worldview, the ability to tell you what a Christian worldview is at the, at the end of the day. And there, to your point of the dramatic demographic shifts in this election, and I, look, I, I don't know those demographic shifting towards the Republican ticket have, have anything to do with them believing in Trump and not basically rejecting the policies in their communities. I think, again, it's not just a vote for, it's a vote against. And that's not, all of us have to make that pragmatic calculation. Now, we need to do it on principle. We need to do it on things that are unchanging. These conscience issues are, 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 are really tough when they, when they emerge. But the real challenge is going to come now in the days ahead, because this isn't, this doesn't fix anything, right? For those who are, excited about the outcome or encouraged about the outcome or just thankful that we're getting a reprieve from a hard, fast direction. There's, there's a lot of indications in this election that that hard, fast direction was what people were voting against. Um, not just economically, although I, I do think at the end of the day, those things tend to be, you know, kind of standards for elections. But the fact that there, there, there was enough racial shift, you know, Everybody being told they're a racist, like people are tired of that. You know, people in the black community, I think, are tired of being told that they're victims. Well, I, you know, look, there, there's a lot to say about that. And the numbers certainly don't bear out like that the whole community changed or anything like that. Sure, sure. Uh, but I tell you where there was, I, I, I think, a interesting, a hard rejection. You know, we talked about the difference at the beginning of 2024 to the beginning of 2023 on the trans issue that that seemed kind of unstoppable. The only thing in America still really propping up that movement on a large scale was this administration and the Department of Education and in HHS. That's going to go away. It's going to be interesting that this might be the end of that movement in any sort of real way. I mean, you're still going to have, you know, TikTokers and all of that sort of stuff. But I think that there is a a huge repudiation of that, that, that came. And I don't think you actually see it as much at the top of the ticket, but that really emerged in a lot of these state level races that were a little bit close. I'm talking about uh, the Senate races in Pennsylvania, Missouri with, uh, you know, th that was a big part of the debate with Josh Hawley um, and also Ted Cruz in Texas. But in some of these even more, you know, close states where these things shifted, the trans issue and, and, and whether, you know, we want m men to play in women's sports and boys to play in girls sports and boys in girls locker rooms and boys on overnight trips with girls. Like, I think there was a, a pretty, that became a, a big issue. And, you know, there may not be enough people willing to go on social media and be really kind of like, this is why I'm voting, but a repudiation of what things have been. Now, here's what we have to warn against. Okay. Did, did everyone just live through how quickly the pendulum shifted? Okay, we did. So realize, you know, 
objects in motion tend to stay in motion and Mm -hmm. there could be another pendulum swing as well. But that's the social things that I see. Now, I don't see it on life. We need to talk about the life issue before we, um, you know, close, you you know, close out our, our conversation here on the election. But the transition to me is really interesting. Um, and I think there's been a repudiation. I think there's been a repudiation and a pushback, particularly on state policies that force it down everybody's throat because it's not what people want. And, and I think you saw that emerge. That's going to be a really interesting thing to watch. I think the beginning of 2025 and, you know, we can, where, where are we? We're what a month, two months out. We can talk about it then and say, you know, what's it feel like today compared to 2024 compared to 2023? But that cultural shift has been pretty dramatic. John, I think the biggest news on the life front is out of Florida. There was a uh, amendment three was on the ballot, similar to the amendment that was on my state's ballot um, a couple of years ago here in Ohio or last year. Gosh, where, where am I? Um, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that time, long ago, was it? Time, man. Um, that would have enshrined, you know, the so-called right to abortion in the state's constitution. And that failed in Florida, which is certainly a positive step. I'm happy for Floridians and for women in Florida and children, obviously, but it didn't pass by a significant margin. And in fact, if they did not have the 60% vote threshold, so 60% of the of the electorate has to vote for an amendment to change the Florida Constitution. Um, if they didn't have that rule in place, then it would have passed because I think it was 57 or 58 percent of the vote that the amendment received. So d- certainly not a decisive victory for life there, but it, it did. Um, it was voted down. So how do you think about this now? I mean, it, it's hard to see this representing any sort of shift back towards, you know, a more pro-life electorate. I mean, yeah, it, it's a hard one to read. And it's not just Florida. It was also uh, Nebraska and uh, South Dakota, where we got for the first time, for the first time since the Dobbs decision, a pro-life win at the state level. That's saying a lot. All right. So we're three for what, 20 something. Um, that's not a good average. Now, three for 10 for this election. I mean, baseball, that gets you in the Hall of Fame, but that, that's not good when it comes to the kind of uh, cause of life in, in America. It's also important, you know, as you said, thank God the Florida uh, amendment did not pass. But the fact that it almost did is it, it needs we get to read the tea leaves. And what I mean by that is it was a 60 percent margin in a state with a million more Republican voters, which, you know, more typically tend to be pro-life and, of course, older pro-life voters as well. If I may real quick, just defend my pro-life community, brothers and sisters here in Ohio We actually, the amendment received a fewer, a lower percentage of the vote here in Ohio, but we don't, we didn't have the 60%. You had the 50, 50. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it, that, that's a big deal. And, and it's not like that there was kind of pro-life, a pro-life advancement, right? In other words, this, this was a win by staving off defeat. (laughs) Does that make sense? Like, thank God we didn't lose this one. Sounds an awful lot like a win when you've had a whole string of losses and it is a win, but, but it's, it's also it's one with the asterisk, you know, that goes in the record books. Um, now, Nebraska voted to, to to hold its law as is, as it did South Dakota. Uh, that was three out of 10. That means seven out of 10 went the wrong way. So there's that reality. Not only did seven out of 10 go the wrong way, a couple of them were blue states becoming even more hostile. So we've talked here. You, people hear me complain about Colorado all the time. Because Colorado is a runaway train towards the killing of innocent life, the preborn and the elderly. That's just what we are. So now in Colorado, we have a situation in which there is a constitutional amendment. It wasn't a ballot initiative. It was an amendment, which meant now the abortion rights without any restrictions whatsoever are now enshrined into the constitution of the state of Colorado. And parental notification has been removed as if a minor's right to an abortion once they become of reproductive age is an inalienable right. That also, of course, inserts state officials in between children and their parents. And then if there's a state-funded insurance plan or a state employee, then state money can fund those those abortions. And that's now there as well. New York, as I understand it, also passed something. I didn't go back and read all the different initiatives. Uh, but New York passed something. Also, there were some of these states like New York that had trans stuff kind of go along with it. So, you know, even though there was a repudiation, I think, as I said in the last segment of, of the trans 
uh, issue in this election that you can see. Uh, there are those who, you know, basically just took that and piggybacked it on the name of reproductive rights, which you talk about playing lo- hard, you know, fast and loose with language, you know, calling the sterilization of, of someone reproductive rights is an odd thing to do. Th- this was not a good thing for life. It was also, we have to say, not a good thing for life and the cause for life because of the party that won, uh, did it after untethering themselves from a cause that had been central to their electorate before. That you have to say that and you have to note. Now, again, to, to, to talk about this election as if people were voting only for and not against is just not true. And it, it just doesn't recognize the reality on the ground. People do vote for the lesser of two evils. I advocated strongly, uh, quoting a friend, to vote for the lessening of evil. Which one of these votes is going to usher in less evil and prevent more evil? That's the calculation you got to make. And we have to say that the party that um, showed up the strongest in a way that we haven't seen in recent years, in recent elections, going back to recent memory, uh, did so after untethering their platform from a defense of life and from an understanding of marriage and family. And I was just in a wonderful conversation with a group of friends uh, and leaders recently in um uh, uh, was talking about this with Ryan Anderson, the head of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, who wrote a, a very important piece in First Things about life after Dobbs. And one of the things he notes there is the safest place for a child is in a stable marriage. When you do the numbers of abortions, I know there's a lot said about, you know, m- married women having abortion, and there are plenty of those, but it, you know, overwhelmingly, if you want to reduce the number of lives that are lost, um, you know, but have children be conceived in marriage. So the untethering from marriage has a direct correlation is what I'm saying to the loss of life. This on a social conservative level, at a state level, on a social conservative level, you can see some real wins. You could see some real pushbacks on some of the radical ideologies. But man, uh, for the co- positive cause of social conservatives that social conservatives care about, this is not a good election for it. Uh, now, it could have been worse. Don't get me wrong. You know, in other words, we'll take what we can get. Uh, so, some might say, and I understand that sentiment, but um, it could have been a lot worse, but it wasn't good. I got to say, John, I just feel really tired. I mean, I'm I'm disappointed in the the way that I see the cultural winds moving on this issue, but I, it also just feels dramatically disconnected from like the ground level of the issue, which is is partly just the nature of it. I mean, it requires philosophical discussion when you're talking about policy and how to think about life and when it begins and how we should treat it, but. You know, I know I've mentioned a, a couple times over the last couple of months that I've been working again at our pregnancy center. And there, there's just, I just have this strange sense of disorientation going there each week and then coming back to my work kind of in this sphere of talking about it, you know, the worldview implications of it, talking about it politically, watching other people talk about it. It just does not even feel like the same conversation. And that makes me tired. E- even, even people who are saying the right and good and true things, I think at some level you, you've got we've got to have people who are teaching about this issue in a national, you know, like a broad way. Um, but it just feels disconnected. And the more defeats that I register, you know, in a political sense, the more I just feel convicted or sort of um, resigned to the idea that this is going to be a person by person, neighborhood by neighborhood. Like, I don't want to be trite about it, but I I want people to get married. I want men to not abandon women. I want couples to be sexually healthy, which means keep sex within the marriage bond. And um, I don't know how to do that by just talking, we can't just talk about it. It's got, it's got to be on the ground, I guess. This gets to the heart of the political illusion. And if we're going to really take seriously that this, what this election told us is that the political illusion is alive and well. And, um, politics matters greatly. The political delusion we also saw, right? Which is people just like, I'm sitting this one out. Um, and I don't care. And, you know, voting is a, actually a wrong thing. Um, and, um, 
and and I think that just kind of underestimates this kind of. I always loved how uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer described it as the tempest of the living. Like like it or not, the real world isn't you know in the um, escape of ideas. The real world is where the rubber meets the road, and you got to make these hard moral decisions. You got to put on the big boy pants and actually just just do it. And we do the best we can to love God and love our neighbor that way. But that that's where politics matters greatly and political outcomes matter greatly. But if you think this solved the problem, if you think that this is some sort of like big sh- – marks some big shift, I, I just don't think it does. And if that shift has happened, it's not going to be sustained because of who's in the White House. There is this reciprocal relationship between politics and the rest of culture. And political outcomes reflect where we are. Um, if we want to go further, uh, then that has to be done outside of that process. If we think, as Jackie Lul said, that because uh, our guy in, all is well, or because our guy is not in, all is lost, and I'm using guy there in a gender-inclusive way, then you're, um, th- th- then you're, you're putting the eggs in the wrong, wrong basket. There is no substitute for the long-term recatechizing of Christians on the things that matter the most. I am more convinced of that than ever. And we know that the church is the voice of truth and the voice of the hope of the world. And the church goes into every square inch, including the political ones, and proclaims Christ as Lord. And that's our job. And if it doesn't happen that way, it's not going to happen. Uh, you know, as some have said, church is God's plan A, there's no plan B. I think that this impulse has really shaped kind of our view at the Colson Center this year. It's, it's, it's shaped how we're thinking about the content of the next conference about the church being the church. And it's really crystallized for me after Tuesday. You know, look, I'm among the many that are grateful. I'm grateful that it was resolved early. I'm grateful uh, that we don't have the, 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 this party, um, that rejects Truth rejects authority, rejects marriage, rejects life and power. And I'm also not confident that the party is in, that's in power. The good news is that there, there's more elbow room to work, but you know it's not going to fix things. Mm-hmm. These, the problems we face are not political. They have political expressions, and those things need to be mitigated and dealt with politically. But the problems, the source, the upstream is bigger than that. And, um, there's not a political fix for that. Um, and it's interesting to me how many secular thinkers are saying the same thing. People who don't really embrace Christianity is true, but they're like, without Christianity, we're not going to actually be able to solve this problem. They're at least seeing it. And they're also seeing that this is a, some of them even use that language. It's a spiritual problem. Like, well, what do you mean a spiritual problem? It's a, We've disconnected from the soul of Western culture. What does that mean? What is the soul? They may not be able to explain all of what they mean, but but basically they're talking about something that's a level deeper. And um, look, I, you you, you got to give people time to celebrate. You got to give people time to be grateful. But then it's like, okay, what are you going to do now? If you're very upset about you know the outcomes, it's like, well, what are you going to do now? The the long term answers lie in a different place. That's the other kind of you are here thing that I think we learned. I do think, you know, again, there was a pushback on the hyper wokeness. There was a pushback on the trans stuff that could be seen, maybe not so much at the top of the ticket, but across the board. There was a uh, a pushback on being kind of lectured all the time for being racist and being, you know, hateful. And, 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 and there was a pushback on all that sort of stuff. But there's also been a clear exposure of the political illusion. And um, that we suffer with. And that includes within the ranks of the church. And so I told the Liberty students on Wednesday, look, really matters who's in the White House. Matters so much more who's in your house. You know, what kind of people are we going to be? Is the church going to be the church? And I, you know, I know that sounds kind of pious and spiritual. And I'm not trying to, you know, kind of over, quote unquote, moralize this. Because I'm not underestimating at all what counts and what matters. Of course it matters. I'll say one more thing, too. I think this also, one, one of the other parts of the political illusion is not just individual people and what they believe. It's also the civilizational level things. And I am grateful that your husband uh, boarded up the offices in vain. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, we're all grateful for that, right? But it, it just underscores, like, if we continue to put all this weight in the political basket as a culture, as a society, 
it, it, eventually it's going to break. It just, it, it's just not big enough to handle the weight we're putting on this process um, and on the people. And um, so uh, that's another thing that has to be reckoned with. And that's where the church excels is the, is the contributing of, to the public good, not just in the political space, but in the pre-political and the extra political realms. Uh, I think we've got some some real opportunities here. John, I have told several people that one of the things that determined my vote truly this election, and I think you could if you had just told me this and nothing else, it probably would have determined my vote from beginning to end, was that six months or so ago, the FBI discovered that the regime of Iran had hacked the presidential campaigns and was actively trying to boost support for Kamala Harris. And I thought, man, of everything else, like, again, I know the price of eggs is ridiculous and I feel unsettled by all sorts of other domestic issues. But if that's if if you want to tell me who Iran is supporting, I will support the other guy. You can be sure of that. Um, I'm sure that was on a lot of people's radar, especially after October 7th. Um, And as you and I are recording this right now, we're watching news come out of the Netherlands where, you know, some people are calling this a pogrom. I think it's we don't know a lot about whether this was organized, but Jewish people are being attacked in the streets. I think you said there was a soccer match. Is that right? Yeah, there's a, a, a an Israeli soccer team. And, and the, okay. you know, it clearly was opportunistic to the fans that, you know, rabidly follow European soccer teams, you know, around. It is not something that you see necessarily in the U.S., Boy. Uh, but this is something that happens. And, um, yeah, I mean, the, the videos are terrible. And it's it's hard to know the scale. It's hard to know whether it was – organized or opportunistic, but it is a reminder that there is still the global realities. And even if an administration is not responsible for what caused those global realities, I think there is a sense of like, who's best capable of of dealing with it. Uh, There was a commentator um, that I heard that, you know, really traced this kind of downward trend for the administration, which culminated in this electoral outcome to the Afghanistan withdrawal. And, I, you know, it's an interesting theory where at that point, you know, it that was handled so badly um, by an administration that was claiming to put the adults back in the room that and and then it was just one thing after another. And there was kind of a devolution. You know, look, I you know, there, there are problems that you don't create and you inherit and you have to figure out, okay, who's best handled, who, who's best equipped to do this. I think the voters did make that calculation as, as part of this as well. If you were going to say, you know, it's more than just the, uh, the economics situation or the economy, but the, the, what you just talked about in this story in the Netherlands, I mean, this is happening, you know, right away, right? So the, the, uh, the challenge that Israel faces and the, this kind of oldest hate crime in the books, you know, this anti-Semitism that never seems to go away. And specifically, this seems to be connected with um, large-scale immigration. Um, You know, these aren't Dutch citizens doing this. Of course, you know, we know that Europeans are capable of anti-Semitism and Americans are capable of anti-Semitism and actually acting on it. In this case, we're talking about the challenge of culture and the migration of cultures, not just the migration of individuals, but individuals that belong to particular cultures and have been shaped by particular cultures. And we're talking here Islam. So the, the challenge between, you know, Islam and the rest of the world to go to Samuel Huntington's thesis of, in the clash of civilizations that may not, they may no longer be the defining clash of our age, but it's a defining clash of our yeah. age, just like was predicted. And that has to do with beliefs. That has to do with worldview. And in a, in a very powerful way. And, you know, to, to see that kind of uh, upscale. And again, we don't know all the details, but it, it's notable enough to mention this is the world that people have to be able to deal with if you're, you're going to lead. And I don't think anyone, if we think that these problems are going to be fixed because of the presidential election, you know, that's 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 crazy. But there has to be at the same level leaders who understand who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, and why. That that's an important thing too that I think emerged in in this in this time. Yes. The enemy of my enemy is my candidate. That's how I <laughs> went to the voting booth at that point. Or at least the friend of my enemy cannot be my candidate. Mm-hmm. And it just it feels it feels unsettling. Um another issue that 
that kind of surpri- had surprising results around the uh, state initiatives this time was the marijuana issue. Also, the California kind of resoundly passed this, you know, what people are calling the tough on crime bill, basically recriminalizing. So for the past, whatever, three or some whatever years to any theft that was valued under $950 in the state of California was considered a misdemeanor. So it was pretty much open season. And um, they they recriminalized it. And that in California, I just want to enunciate that one more time. In the state of California, they recriminalized um, theft. And, you know, some of these um, pretty major marijuana initiatives, you know, passing the Massachusetts. Marijuana is legal in Massachusetts, but a ballot measure that would have legalized psychedelics like psilocybin, um, which is mushrooms, failed. There were other states, too, looking at, you know, legalizing or expanding marijuana legislation or rights. And the voters seem to be having second thoughts about that. I think part of the answer here probably, too, is the tempest of the living where people I mean, your state has seen kind of the disaster of traffic accidents and low levels of employment, uh, you know, and all this kind of thing uh, resulting from the passage of legalizing this kind of thing. But Um, This makes me tired, too, because it feels like another example of people theoretically saying, oh, I'm for autonomy. People should be able to do what they want. And then it takes, you know, 10 years of people getting really badly hurt and things going super wrong for people to say, oh, well, that was a mistake. Um, And yeah, that's just exhausting. But I think it's it's great news. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great news because it goes along with some things in other parts of the culture. I mean, we've seen the New York Times publish pieces saying, you know, look, we, um, we, we now know more about the harms of marijuana and they're, and they're serious. And, you know, the preventative, uh, regulatory, uh, you know, measures to hold back the extreme, you know, uh, forms of, uh, of pot and the extra strong versions of it, um, and so on. Um, uh, you know, that's not keeping up. And, 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 and there's been a lot of that kind of pushback. And um, there's also the same thing happening right now in sports gambling. And, you know, I think yeah. all of this together is basically helping to push back on this kind of incentivizing particularly young males uh, to be perpetual adolescents. And a lot of these kind of freedom measures that have passed state by state over the years, which we did not see in this election, aren't really like you can go have the freedom to be successful. It's you can have the freedom to be an idiot, right? You know, th- this is, the, this is the incentivizing of, 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 of sports gambling and, and marijuana. And, you know, I think there was even a, something on the ballot about hallucinogens in New York, maybe that magic mushrooms that failed, which of course it passed well, that in was Colorado. Mass- Massachusetts. Was that Massachusetts that did that? Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't just, yeah. So th- th- these are, Great signs. Like people are starting to realize this. Now, is that part of the trend that was also reflected in the split between men and women on who they voted for for president? That's that's an interesting thing. And you see the kind of the the people that young men look up to now more are the people who are challenging them. You know, Um, Anthony Bradley, who I, you know, follow religiously on X because I really believe he is helping me understand a lot of things, particularly about young men and their dads, but also as a, uh, a black s- scholar, he really kind of undoes some of the narratives on th- the black issue while not just kind of, and he, he's, he always is willing in my mind to go where the, um, the evidence leads. I don't always like, you know, what he says, but I, he's just a fascinating thinker. And I always have to reckon with it. And he said, you know, President Obama stumping for Kamala Harris basically talked down and lectured, you know, black men as being kind of misogynist and whatever. And he goes, Mm -hmm. that's not going to work. And it didn't work. And there's going to be a reaction to it. And of course, we saw kind of incredible numbers in that community that that moved in another direction. And, and, you know, look, I think sometimes Trump airs in his messaging. Like, you know, I'll be your savior. I'll be the one who will fix everything rather than, you know, kind of leading the cause. But the voices that are in the conservative movement right now that are speaking to young men are 
you know, they're the ones telling them to get up, make your bed and go get a job and don't be a jerk. You know, I feel like Um, I have a, this is an opportunity for me. I've been waiting for this my whole life. I could become (laughs) that kind of voice for young men. Is that right? First of all, put your dishes in the dishwasher. Second of all. (laughs) (laughs) Are you talking to young men or your daughters? I was born for this. Is that Um, right? I I may or may not be talking to my husband, but go on. Oh, dude, you just. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh my goodness. Wow. (laughs) Um, no, I, I, th- th- there is a crisis of, of a young men and what they're for. We've been talking mm-hmm. about this in various forms for such a long time. And I think there were, it's interesting when you see a political, uh, expression of this and maybe I'm too hopeful on the pushback on marijuana. Maybe it was just, you know, connected with the safety issue and connected with the drugs across the border issue in ways that I'm not seeing here, but I, you know, I'm at least hopeful um, that this kind of, uh, the way you fix young men is not by telling them to stop being men. The way you fix young men is by calling them to something bigger and better that God made them for. And, um, you know, maybe there's some indications, uh, you know, here on that. Hey, before we go too, got to give a shout out to West Virginia, West Virginia, uh, voted to ban doctor assisted suicide and, uh, interesting analysis of that. I haven't, you know, you know, we have talked so much about that issue just by looking to Canada. Um, and I guess what I had lost track of is since uh, a few years back and really since Canada really kind of embraced doctor assisted suicide and started going down that slippery slope faster than any nation we'd ever seen in history in the United States, that issue has really slowed down. There's really been a pushback on that. Now, there hasn't been much political action either advancing it or restricting it. But West Virginia is the first state to say, we're not going to do that here. And that's great. Um, So I think that uh, that needs to be at least mentioned. Um, And I wonder if there is momentum here because I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm always hesitant to kind of claim we have a moral majority or the majority of people really think this about abortion or that about abortion. Cause I think almost all of our guesses have been wrong on that. Um, and all of our proclamations of kind of we're more moral than we think we are is are wrong. I'm hopeful on this one because and it may be just the horror of watching, you know, people with PTSD in Canada get greenlit or autism and younger and younger and younger and younger and younger in the name of freedom and to see the pressure that's put on by the system, you know, a state run system that basically will cover drugs for Dying early, but will not cover drugs for taking care of the the condition that one has. You know, you start seeing these headlines and you're like, oh, yeah, this is not what we want here. So that's that's encouraging. Praise God. Yeah, that is really encouraging. Okay, John, let's talk about some recommendations for the week. Um, I will start and I have to start by I'm totally going to do my Maria thing and just take this wherever I want to take it. it. Today, as we're recording this, November 8th. Today is my parents' 44th wedding anniversary, and my parents are amazing. Congratulations, mom and dad. Also, you know, we were talking offline a little bit about just the the feeling of a loss of trust and how that can be disorienting and upsetting. And one of the gifts, I mean, my parents' marriage is one of the most profound gifts that I've ever received. And one of the impacts of it on my life is just a never ending sense of stability. And I obviously am in my late thirties. So I've been out of the house for a long time. I've got my own life going on, but just still having that sense of stability in my life, um, is incredibly meaningful to me and my kids and my husband too, who has not had the same experience in his family. So way to go mom and dad. You guys are awesome. Um, my recommendation this week is going to be, it's going to sound cheesy, but I don't mean it to legitimately please pray for the people who were elected in this cycle. And I mean, like, close your door and open the Psalms and pray through the Psalms and praise Jesus when the Psalms praise him and ask for help when they ask for help. That is one of my favorite ways that our pastor at our church always encourages us to pray is to pray through scripture. Sometimes when you don't know what to say or how to pray, it can be so helpful and beautiful. And I The older I get, the more I am a believer in the impact of prayer on our own hearts, but on actual life on the ground as well. So please pray for our elected officials. 
Yeah, you know, I, I that's a, a a good word, and um, you know, since you mentioned it, that there is something that I'm realizing more and more too: the stability of my mom and dad's marriage, the stability of my grandparents um, on uh, both sides. Although I didn't know my grandfather because he passed away, um, but I um, we talked a lot about Fidelity Month in June, and I've become more and more intrigued by the idea of fidelity as a as a as a means of Christian witness. And, you know, Chuck had his plaque on his desk, faithfulness, not success. It's a call to fidelity, but it's not just an abstract thing. It's, it's a call to be faithful to the people that you, um, are called to love and care for. And, and, and then the downstream effects of that are hard to imagine. So, I, you know, my wife's parents, uh, also, and, you know, they came out of, you know, broken situations to, to, uh, stay married. And, um, you know, what that does for us, we're just, I think now really realizing and, you know, yeah. grateful for, um, so I'm tempted to recommend fidelity month, but it doesn't come across till next June, but because it, I, 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 I do think it. this is, well, it, it, it's just, it's a way of thinking about it. And I also, in, in a conversation this week, just realized too, is somebody was kind of talking about the vision, you know, for that and thinking about that idea of fidelity, it, it's, it's fundamentally an outward turn, whereas Carl Truman wrote in The Triumph of the Modern Self, all of life turns you inward. So in other words, fidelity and pride are in stark contrast on all kinds of levels. Uh, not only one's a seven de- one of the seven deadly sins and the other one's not, um, but the other one, <laughs> the other aspect of it is the inward versus the outward turn. But that's not what I'm going to recommend. Um, two thumbs up, just had a great experience this week at Liberty University. I uh, am well known for having a level of skepticism uh, about institutions, uh, particularly um, uh, institutions of higher education, particularly Christian ones. Um, and uh, I'm also, you know, recording this today uh, up in Michigan, having, you know, heading up to watch my daughter in a concert. I'm very excited to hear her solos tonight. Um, Ooh, cool. and, um, yeah, that's, it's, it's going to be exciting, but Liberty got a lot of bad headlines a couple of years ago. They're so big. They're easy to take shots at and they take a lot of shots. Uh, there are good people on that campus and the new president, uh, I mentioned earlier, Don DeCostin is really emerging as one of the premier leaders, Christian leaders in America. There's a, a, a healing and a healthiness and a, a way forward and a vision and an excitement. It's hard to, it's hard to talk about and describe accurately, you know, 10,000 college students when college students get such a bad rap these days with the energy and the, 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 um, the care that they have at Liberty university. Yeah. You know, they don't bat a thousand who, who does. There is a, an energy level you see there. There's a commitment and a seriousness you see at Hillsdale. And I think these are two schools right now, very different, you know, very, I think, different on all kinds of levels. OK, but they're really clear on mission and they're really clear on what they're delivering and what they're after. And that lack of clarity is a plague of Christian colleges. There you go. You know, we're, we're all looking forward to send our kids. I, I was joking with some folks this week. Big, big. A, a big criteria is are, are, are there marriageable spouses there? Like that's a big one, right? Where else is it going to happen? Um, and so I, yeah, I can attest to both of these, um, schools in that regard too. I'm, I'm glad to hear it because I have been saying for a couple of years that my girls are just going to learn a trade. They're going to be steel workers. Or something I'm, <laughs> well, and honestly, I'm too scared of the- that may be, that may be the choice, you know, even for some of our, for some <laughs> oh, of our kids Lord. as well. You know, yeah. I think that's absolutely legitimate. Not a bad route. Yeah. Um, but there is a. A, a difference between what's promised and what's delivered on campuses all across America. And I, I'm not sure that's the case with these two institutions. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty confident they're, they're delivering what they promise. And so two thumbs up. Thankful for that. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's going to do it for our special election edition of Breakpoint this week. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you could see the face that John's making at me right now. Oh, it's, it's over, is it? No, it's not over. That's the, you know, it, it, it kind of reminds you. I found myself talking about who the candidate for, you know, 2028 is going to be. And I was like, this oh, is like Lord, that don't. movie Elf. I can't. You know, where they're like, Christmas is over. Now it's time to start, start for next year. Start over. Oh, I can't. Yeah.
Yeah, no. nope. Well, otherwise, I'm Maria Bear for the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, alongside John Stone Street, president of the Colson Center. Thank you guys for listening. As always, have a wonderful week. See you next week. <laughs>